This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton. And you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi, and welcome back to episode 205 of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast. And yes, I'm David Charlton, and today I'm going to be talking to another sports psychologist, Dr. Carl Beskeby, and we're going to be discussing injury. Now, most athletes at some point do find that they do get injured. Obviously, it's going to depend on the sport and the severity of the injury as to how much injury goes on to impact them. Some sports, as you'll be well aware, are pretty brutal. They can be very, very tough, and some people can be very unlucky with injuries. Anyway, as far as this podcast goes, we're going to be talking about how us as sports psychologists can help the athlete and the physio, and possibly the strength and conditioning coach too, when it comes down to post-injury. So yeah, we're going to be looking at recovery and the challenges that athletes go through when they are recovering from injury. We're also going to be looking at the return to sport and how we can help athletes return mentally sharp with their confidence intact. Enjoy. Hi Carl, it's great to meet you. Would you be able to share with the listeners a little bit about your background and your fascination with injured athletes? Yeah, thanks David. Thanks for having me. Um, And yeah, good to to be here. I'm Carl Buscovi. I'm a a psychologist, call myself the injury psychologist, um, because I'm really fascinated about the link between psychology and injury and um, kind of have this desire to help injured athletes and performers navigate the psychological components um, and try and help them adjust and grow throughout their rehabilitation, their recovery journeys. And my interest in that came from my own experience. Um, as for m- much of us, it does. But I played rugby for for a long time growing up, uh, and when I got to university, I was studying psychology at the time, and uh, I was experiencing quite a lot of injuries. Um, it started little niggles, and then more serious injuries. And for a good twelve months, I was going through a number of different challenges um, on the physical injury side, and. I just put two and two together with what I was learning and tried to understand a little bit more as to what was going going on there. Um, and yeah, that sent me down the path of I eventually retired from rugby and continued down the education route just to understand a little bit more about the psychological side of injury, what kind of contributes to the causes from a psychological point of view, and how do we support people that are going through injury because it's can be quite an isolating um frustrating uh and emotionally turbulent experience so that set me on to to become a psychologist um i spent a couple of years down at bath uh doing a phd uh working with transplant athletes um kind of from a self-management perspective from a psychological perspective um and yeah did my training to become a practitioner and and ever since just been working to support athletes uh, rehabilitation journeys and helping them deal with and manage kind of the mental side of injury chronic pain and and also illness so so yeah right okay so you've probably touched on about t- 10 different areas we could take in this podcast let's start with rugby i know when i've worked in a in a rugby setting before it really surprised me the the amount of players who actually spend time on the treatment table week to week. So, yeah, do you do you want to just share a little bit more about maybe any, some experiences you've had with with rugby players? Yeah, I, th- I think for me, for me, for my my experience being on on the field, there was this uh, mentality that of kind of this no pain no gain um, kind of culture. Um, and that was that we had to go through a certain amount of pain and suffering and injury to to be able to to push performance and to to kind of give to the team and i felt that quite challenging because it put pressures on individuals to play whilst injured to perform under 
with with niggles and and it often led to more serious severe uh injuries so i think for me that experience of the cultural side of of rugby was maybe what contributed to to some of my injuries um and maybe some of the the other individuals that i was playing with um but yeah i think psychologically there's there's a big thing we know rugby is a contact sport a lot of injuries happen there's a lot of evidence and research coming out about concussions and um a lot of law changes in rugby to try and mitigate some of the uh effects that we're seeing on the pitch um certainly from grass loop, grassroot level all the way up um so so yeah that was really my experience but i guess it just set me on a path to try and find out more about the psychological side so yeah that cultural side was a big pressure and probably influenced my time on the pitch and on the field um but yeah i wanted to work on understanding what goes on psychologically a bit more if that makes sense no it certainly does yeah i'm just thinking about the cultural side so obviously you've talked about the like the the laws of the game changing what do you think in well in your opinion can the maybe key stakeholders head coaches, coaching staff, support staff, what can they do in, in a rugby setting, do you think, um, that can, can aid this process? It's a really tough question because I think they're trying. And um, rugby is a sport. I'm also a big fan. Um, I love watching the game. But there's always rule changes that are being brought in, um, which makes it harder for, for any uh, neutral or newcomer to watching the game to really understand what's going on and, and to pick up on the nuances of the game. Um, so I think they are trying. That There's been a lot of evidence and research from um, the University of Bath around tackle height and trying to lower tackle height to reduce uh, concussion and head injuries. Um, and it seems to be ongoing uh, as they brought in new tackle heights to try and reduce injuries. There's there's concerns from the players themselves that these are not going to mitigate the the circumstances the sport is just demanding physically and players are bigger and better and stronger and faster um, which offers a great spectacle but there's just not that much room on the pitch for players to run into so they're finding themselves running into each other and you know that creates a lot of injury Um, so it's it's tough. I think you can really go further down into why players play sport and what's, you know, the emphasis on winning is so big now that players will really go to, to far lengths to, to compete and to perform and to, to get an inch. Um, but it's just comes, I think, at a cost later down the line when you see a lot of players who retire unable to pick their kids up or, you know, unable to function in everyday life because of what they went through on the pitch for those 20 years of their career. So I think more needs to be done to to protect and support the players. And I know companies like Podium Analytics are doing some some pretty good stuff to try and reduce injury across all sport. Um, but more needs to be done. I think it's a complex one to try and deconstruct. Yeah, no. As as you say, there's there's so many factors there. It's very complex. What one thing that was spring to my mind was, as a player, if you're going to be playing through injury, playing through the the pain barrier, ultimately there has to be a, a degree of honesty with with the coaching staff. That can be difficult in itself, though, can't it? because the the coach is picking the team and you want to pick the team. So. Yeah, is I don't know the psychological safety. Do you think that comes into it at all, as far as a culture? Yeah, I think that's massive. If you can uh, adopt a culture where it's okay to um, to have setbacks and injuries, and just to accept and be honest and open about it, I think the challenge is that players want to be picked and want to play. So, like you say, I think they introduce loads of like self-report measures to get players to really reflect honestly about their their bodies and how they're feeling. But a lot of them opt against it because they feel that that decision might go against selection criteria, might go against their their opportunities that they get on the field. So it's a, a real tough one. But if you can introduce some sort of psychological flexibility or just an openness to that vulnerability to allow players to to really express how they feel physically and also mentally. 
because we might be physically ready but if we're not psychologically ready then uh, we, we might be limited in what we can achieve um so to be open about that and i think sport is going a long way in doing that you know we see the, the simone biles at the olympics um, pulling out for, for for mental reasons or to look after mental health we do see players uh, stepping back from the arena to give themselves an opportunity to either psychologically or physically re- recover um so it is happening and maybe those examples are, are starting to set the scene in sports where the culture has been kind of not one of psychological flexibility or vulnerability before yeah and, and again i suppose it probably depends on the individual sports in some respects and the i don't know just again the way the, the organizations the way the governing bodies are set up and the just the, the general general messages that get out there to people and the culture mm-hmm. Anyway, let's let's uh, have a little think more about the the individual. So you talked about how it can be like quite isolating as an individual when you when you come across a serious injury. How as a how as a psychologist do you go to you know try and help that individual? Yeah, that's a a, a really good question. Uh, I think you know we know that the link between uh, psychology and, and injury is is profound and quite complex um for for an individual it it situates a lot of emotional responses like you mentioned that isolation um anxiety fear um we go through many many different emotions likened to the, the kind of grieving process if you like um but also a number of psychological responses um lots of identity fear uh and anxiety especially when building up to uh, returning um you know in some cases depression and low mood could be be a consequence of that so there's a lot going on i think first and foremost is just giving the individual that space to process those emotions um and that emotional response um to normalize it to accept it to know that it's that it's okay uh, and just finding coping mechanisms to um manage the emotional and the uh, psychological responses to to injury uh and in doing that we can find a way to reframe the injury experience as, as one that offers opportunities to grow and to develop and to to gain something from rather than this idea that it's a loss that it's a loss of self it's a loss of sport we're falling back because that just sets up um, pressure and expectations to to get back on the field or into the sport so holding space for those emotions um, normalizing them and finding ways to accept them and, and managing and navigating the psychological responses um, through through coping resources um, would, would be my first port of call what i'm hearing there is the it sounds like i suppose like a counseling style approach Active listening, listening skills are, are, are vital, not necessarily the problem focused approach, if you like, and our solution oriented approach. Yeah, I, I think in terms of my philosophy, it, it, it's it's a bit blended. Um, I, I utilize uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and been trained in it um, and compassion focused therapy. So I think I, I lend on those as tools to, to support that process for, for injured athletes. But there is that, just that humanity, um, just that, that kind of humanistic approach to, to supporting that initial, uh, loss, that initial experience of, of injury, uh, is, is certainly there. So just holding that space seems to be quite powerful and it resonates with a lot of athletes because for them that, They've experienced an injury. I work with a lot of uh, ACL injured athletes, um, so their re journeys are quite long. Um, and initially, it's just holding space for that forced stop, which they're having to to come to terms with. Um, and the sooner we can move towards accepting or the acceptance of that, the sooner we can we can look at the opportunities to grow and develop. And um, and that's when those tools come in but i i also believe that everyone has the tools within them to to navigate what they're dealing with 
It's just about connecting the dots. So there is a bit of that solution focused approach in there as well, um, which kind of makes that philosophy a bit, uh, a bit miss- messy. Um, but yeah, I think the most important thing is that it's, it's client led and it's, it comes from the individual and I, I let them lead and take the lead on their own journeys. And I just try and help facilitate that in, in, in the background. No, I know from my own personal experiences of injury, and I've had too many to, to think about, um, where when it, as an athlete, like you, you're, um, I don't know, you're, you've got your habits where you, you're training, you're, you're playing competitively five, six days a week, and your time's taken up so much like with the sport and everything that goes with it. It must be really, really difficult for these athletes who maybe do have an ACL where they're just told, right, you've just got to down tools and, and just simply rest and, and relax for a period before they go through their rehab. Absolutely. I think it's one of the biggest challenges that you've identified there, David, because there's also a sense in that activity that they engaged in their sport, their their exercise, whatever it, it is, is is often their coping resource as well their coping mechanism for for stress for for day-to-day stresses that that go on in their life so they they lose that as well um and they've got to fill this void this void of time um what do we do with this and for a lot of them acl or or significant serious injuries the the rehabilitation becomes a full-time job as well and it's trying to to keep that structured and routine in place um, and treat it in the same way that they would their sport. Um, so oftentimes they will use psychology as a uh, um, and the sessions that we have together as a, as a way of filling in a bit of that that time that they would maybe spend uh, in their sport. But I think one of the biggest things that comes from that is the that we touched on earlier the isolation. Right, they they stepped away from those structures of their sport. Um, and maybe not surrounded by the people that they, they once were. So it's trying to encourage individuals to, to keep involved in, in any way they can. And although it's hard to step back into the arena when you're injured and you can't perform, it, it's about trying to keep involved for, from a social support perspective. We know social support is one of the biggest buffers of stress. Um, and injury is a stressor. So we, we can find ways to mitigate that stress. We're going to encourage better rehabilitation outcomes uh, and recovery outcomes for, for these individuals. So, yeah, but it's also, I guess, trying to find ways to help individuals cope because now their coping resource or mechanism in their sport is no longer there as well. So what else can they utilize to, to help fill that void? Are you able to share some examples of? Of the, the the other resources there, the, the what, what is the what else for some players or some athletes? Yeah, um, it's it's a tough one because you know wh- how do we 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 can't replace that that sport, so we can only kind of look internally. And the, the the top components for me are just finding ways to or or, or developing those coping mechanisms. Um, to, to look after emotional well-being but also keep that adherence uh, and motivation to to the treatment um so encouraging uh social support encouraging uh individuals to build that network um to improve their their involvement but also keep that communication with their families with their friends with their with their support providers um and for some individuals it's about working on their their esteem uh, and their their confidence so injuries can sometimes really affect um individual self esteem uh, and body image i work with a lot of dancers um and as an aesthetic sport there's a lot of challenges around uh, body image and and eating once injured um so it's trying to uh, it, it encourage healthy routine and balance in in those aspects of everyday life to to support their general well-being um the other thing in terms of coping is just managing stress so finding ways i mean stress is the biggest predictor of injury but also injury is a big predictor of of stress it's a big stressor so trying to encourage stress management techniques to help individuals deal with these challenges effectively 
whether that's you know in, in engaging in relaxation techniques, um, visualizing success, celebrating small victories, finding ways to to navigate stress um, and, and talk about stress, uh, I think is also an important coping resource or mechanism. So I guess all of these ways and these coping resources aren't tools that you can just plant in as such. They're more things that are adaptable to each individual um and one of the i guess the biggest areas that i work in with with injured athletes is building to the return of sport is this kind of fear and anxiety um related to either physical activities or certain movements after an injury um and for some athletes or for a lot of athletes the this fear and this anxiety can lead to this um, cycle of kind of fear avoidance behaviors, which can not only hinder recovery, but can keep individuals from returning. If they're experiencing pain, can keep the cycle of pain um, at the forefront. So trying to utilize things like exposure therapy, um, the strategies to try and reduce um, and overcome these fears uh, is it's been quite a big area of work that I've stepped foot in um, and one that continues to challenge me as well uh, moving forward. So I don't know if that answers your question at all, but uh, yeah, I've just written a little bit. <laughs> no, I did it, it did in a roundabout way. I was, yeah, I was, it was, it was good. Um, you've, you've a couple of, couple of things. I suppose, do you work with closely with physios at all and as an injury psychologist? I do. Yeah. So, I partner with quite a lot of physios, um, both from a, an educational perspective for them, but also as a as a referral network for for their athletes who who are maybe they identify as struggling physically or or, um, or mentally even with with their recovery or their injury. So yeah, I help um, kind of educate physios on some of the, the psychological components. Um, to to injury and re- recovery and try and offer some tools for them to implement in in their practice because I see that they are at the forefront of supporting athletes and um, they've already got a relationship and have broken down those barriers to be able to to support them emotionally in, in some cases and for a lot of physios they they feel um, and this is from my own kind of experiences and research that I've done, th- these athlete, these physios feel um, maybe less equipped to manage and navigate the emotional side that athletes then kind of come and disclose with them. So I've tried and, and continue to through, through courses and CPD to offer that um, the tool set for physios to, to support their athletes in that way. And also, to, to look after themselves in that process because it can be a, a large emotional burden on, on them as well. So yeah, that, that is an area that I continue to work with and in. And I hope to continue to try and support physios to, to manage and navigate that in, in their own right in, in some respects as well. I imagine as well, if you're like working with an athlete, you've got to be very careful in. If you're going to offer some advice, um, you you'll need to be like working with the physio to understand what it is that the the athlete is actually capable of. If you're looking at it, I don't know alternative ways of, of exercising. Uh, absolutely, and and I do work with with physios, especially in in the return to sport kind of phase for a lot of athletes, because what we want to do is make sure that their psychological readiness is 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 high enough to. To enable a, an effective return so i work with physios to help support them on how they, they can introduce uh, certain activities and exercises that is going to expose athletes to a certain level of anxiety but in a controlled sense that enables them to build a resistance to it that enables that psychological readiness or the confidence in their ability to perform in their in their body's ability to perform to increase to a level where we're actually going to mitigate any risk of re-injury because if that anxiety or that fear is really high, it's going to create a physical response in athletes that is going to um, make them more susceptible to experiencing an injury again. You know, their their attentional uh, narrowing 
uh, occurs. Uh, so they're less likely to pick up on the environmental cues. Their body might tense up and, and get more uh, tight. So they're increasing their susceptibility to re-injury. So we want to mitigate that and reduce that factor. So I work with physios to help um, support them and the kind of introduction of those types of uh, activities that they're going to do. But also from a mental component, I'll work with physios to understand the types of activities that they're um offering to their athletes during recovery and help support that visual process that mental process so that we can as a psychologist with the athlete work on um, managing the kind of mental reps whilst they work with the physical reps with with physiotherapists so i think it's a big area i think one with with a lot more opportunity to really combine um, and offer that real multidisciplinary approach to, or holistic approach to recovery um and it's an area that i'm really passionate about so i'd love to engage with physios and 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 try and bridge that gap as much as we can yeah and no, i can see how it's a i suppose an emerging area really in as in the well in the field of sports psychology there how yeah it just it just i suppose it's going to be a case of he's banging the drum isn't it and keep keep educating physios ab- about some of these different tools and techniques that you've got up your sleeve there and and yeah it'd be very interesting to see where we're at in what 10 years time 15 years time one one question as well here um just thinking about supposing i've had an acl and mm. i'm coming towards the my my return to sport and i'm lacking a little bit of confidence there as to how I'm going to get on and whether I'm going to perform as the way I did. What, what sort of like psychological tools do you have in your toolkit there to be able to help that person? Yeah. So firstly, I would identify where their their confidence is at in terms of uh, the, their readiness um, and get an understanding standing of the where that uncertainty lies um because that psychological readiness is um to do with that fear or anxiety or that sense of uncertainty in that return so there's some there's some feelings there associated with that that return um and for some it's around their their expectations of what that return is going to look like so so there we would look at managing expectations um to reduce the pressure that they're putting on themselves to return um and in doing that then we can address the confidence um and working on confidence it's about trying to build that trust up in their body again so in the past i've used things like visualization or mental reps to to help individuals prepare them best prepare themselves for for what that experience is going to be like when they return Um, so that they can do the reps and kind of visualize the process of performing that skill and that technique or um, their their activity in a way that encourages um, their confidence to to increase in in some way. Um, And in doing that and managing those expectations, um, finding ways to expose and um, negate any fear or anxiety that's going on, through kind of exposure therapy or um, ways of exposing them to situations, I feel that that comes hand in hand with being able to to build into those mental reps to increase that confidence. So I would say trying to introduce that as early on as as possible um, for for individuals, but getting them to build that kind of confidence wall, if you like, or asking them, you know, if they had unlimited confidence, what would they, how would they approach the situation? Um, and then trying to modify that behavior in ways that, that they did have that confidence. So encouraging them to, to take steps towards how they would behave if they had unlimited confidence. Um, any case, anyway, you know, to do that, even if they weren't feeling confident. Um, so sometimes in my work, it's about behavior first and, and the kind of thinking part second when it comes to confidence. Because for a lot, a lot of individuals I work with, there's this idea that confidence is this magical thing that's going to arrive uh, one day. And when it does, it's everything's going to be great. And it's a kind of this arrival fallacy 
that that limits a lot of individuals because we're waiting a long time for this confidence to be there and and often times it, it isn't so we've got to find ways to just behave in ways that give us a sense that we are confident so behavior first is is my approach there i don't know if that makes sense at all or is that similar to to how or, or where you would fit confidence in no you, you i think you, you bang on you, you you know you're you're right when you talk about how i suppose a performer before they go out in a in a competitive event to match how they want to have those feelings of confidence but often i suppose you've got to you've got to be, get to the point where you're comfortable being uncomfortable in some respects don't you so i'm guessing you know i suppose for a lot of injured athletes they are going to be uncomfortable when they go out on those first first appearances and am i right here the way you talk there in a way you're creating a but some positive mental movies in their mind, be it through visualization, just being being through some of the questions you ask them and and what it is that you explore. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that imagery, that 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 uh, visualization is really important at that point, especially if they're physically limited, because they, they maybe can't do the physical actions to increase their confidence. They can't do the physical reps. Uh, along the way but they can certainly keep training on on the mental reps to keep themselves involved in in what that activity is like and knowing that they can still step into that and and perform it but yeah i think just helping individuals to reframe the injury experience as one where they can learn new skills they can develop and grow in grow in in ways that maybe they didn't think they could before but like you say leaving their comfort zone stepping into that discomfort um but maybe setting realistic you know as basic as it is setting realistic goals for for themselves and managing those expectations that they have when they return because sometimes those expectations are sky high or athletes feel like they can um they can return back to to the level they were before or or even better um and a lot of media and culture drives that narrative as well um, when we see professional athletes returning to the stage we expect and demand more of them than we did when they when they left it so it's just trying to re- address those and ensure that they are realistic expectations that the goals that they set for themselves are, are manageable and attainable in that first instance but just focusing on their strengths allowing that psychological safety that vulnerability to say you can go out there and, and make mistakes and and that's okay, you know, just to reduce that pressure and demand on yourself to to engage in that activity again. But if individuals have reframed their, their rehab journey in, in this one where they can experience growth, I think there's there's ways when when they return that they that they emulate that com- confidence. Um because of what they've gone through because of that adversity and how they've overcome it so yeah there's a multitude of factors there but i think those mental reps visualization um as early on in the rehab process as possible and and building it through uh it's it's hugely important and then leaving that comfort so knowing that that this that discomfort being uncomfortable is an opportunity to 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 learn and grow and, and develop in in new ways I like that. It makes a makes an awful lot of sense there, Cole. Are you able to share with the listeners three key takeaways from our conversation here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I've, I've uh, banged on about this already, but set realistic expectations for your return and acknowledge your feelings and make room for them throughout that process. Um, if you can, keep that support network in a place um where there's open communication with healthcare providers whether that's physiotherapists psychologists um other practitioners your teammates um your friends and family keep that support system um operative um because it's going to be useful in terms of mitigating some of the feelings around isolation um but also it's going to help manage and buffer stress and injury is a stressful experience and we need to to have it and, and pull on those resources that we have within us to navigate that 
So that would be the second, just um, keep that social support system operative. Um, and the third one, I think, is celebrate your small victories, visualize success, maintain that positive kind of uh, growth oriented mindset. Fantastic. That's not three really, really helpful tips there for the, for the viewers and the, and the listeners. So yeah, big thank you for your time, Carl. Whereabouts can people get a hold of you should they want to ask you some questions? Yeah, thanks, David. And um, yeah, it's been really, really great speaking. Um, if you want to find out more, um, I'm on socials on, on Instagram at The Injury Psychologist, um, or you can check out my website, uh, theinjurypsychologist.com. Um, and yeah, please feel free to to reach out if you're an athlete, physio, um, always keen to engage and keep that dialogue going. I think, um, you know, injury can be a really tough experience, but also one that offers so much opportunity to to grow and develop and learn. So you can learn through connecting and, and through sharing those experiences. So yeah, please do reach out. Brilliant. All right. A big thank you, Carl. Thanks. As Carl alluded to, confidence is seen as the holy grail for a lot of athletes. They want to be able to stand on the pitch, the track or the course, feeling really, really good. Now, the reality is when you're coming back from injury, there may be more butterflies than normal. And as we discuss, it is a skill to be able to recognise that this is actually okay. To have those butterflies, to be feeling nervous, that it is completely normal. And another thing with regards to confidence, I'm going to share an example of a rugby player. So for argument's sake, confidence, confidence in one's ability is when you could feel and when you can see the pass that's in front of you and then you simply just execute that pass. Or maybe on tackling, you quickly build a mental picture of you crunching in with the tackle and then again you execute. And this all takes part in a split second. So there's no time for overthinking to catch you out. You know, thinking about how good you were a few months ago, or how bad you were, or maybe going back to training sessions last time out. Spending time in the past thinking about how you executed different skills there. And then there's the future. There's no time to try to predict the future, to worry about not being able to perform the task in hand. When we've got confidence in our ability, it's very much a quick, automatic reaction, and we just do things. So how do you actually get to that point when you recognise that feeling confident is actually only a feeling? Well, what I would say is it's understanding your enablers or your sources of confidence. Where you get confidence from, this is the starting point. And could it be simply getting to bed early the night before is going to give you a better chance to feel confident? Could it be eating the right food, making sure that you're well hydrated? Perhaps ensuring that your fitness levels are really, really high. Then we've got praise from other people. Perhaps from coaches or teammates or other people in your life. And naturally we've got past performances. So it might be in a match, it might be in training, or it might be an immediate performance. For some people this is key to feeling good about themselves. And However, what I would say about that, and some of the other aspects that I've touched on, It's really important to recognise that some things are within your control and some aren't. So whether you choose to put food in your body, nice food, nutritious food, or you keep yourself hydrated, that's your choice. Whereas the positive feedback from a coach or a teammate, well, that's their stuff. That's up to them. So you can't hang your hat on that. And that's the same about past performances too. Whether it's the immediate performance, when you're in a game, or past training session or past matches they're out of your control and really they don't have to have a bearing on your future at all unless you let it. So adding to what Carl and I discussed there we could add visualization onto this. You know when we go back to the conversation Carl and I had visualization really can as an injured athlete or a fit athlete for that matter help you tap into positive feelings associated with producing a skill like passing in rugby because in some sort of way You're hypnotising yourself into feeling like you've been out on the pitch, on the court, loads and loads of times. And obviously, as an injured athlete, that may well have not been the case for you. But actually, you know, the brain, it can't distinguish between what you've done and the mental imagery side. So it's worth bearing that one in mind, especially when we think about skill acquisition there. And on that note, you might want to go back to episode 7 
a really early podcast episode where I interviewed former England Rugby Union player Toby Flood and we touched on this topic. Though we didn't necessarily talk about injury, he just touched on the fact that he used imagery as a part of his routine when he got older towards the end of his career. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode and for more tips and tricks and resources helping you, whether you're feeling good or not, please do sign up to The Mental Edge. It's a regular newsletter that goes out currently on a fortnightly basis where I go on to share podcasts, blogs, videos and many other resources to be able to help you get the most from your sport. Enjoy your day. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. The Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.